This desktop mini lecture introduces a new force, the electrostatic force, that exists between what we're going to call charged particles. Along with desktop mini lectures 1C and 1B, this constitutes the first full lecture in Physics 2. Mini lecture 1B contains review material on working with vectors, 1C contains new material. We'll also post relevant videos of demonstrations to complement these desktop lectures. Okay, we have to start out in experimental physics asking what are the observations. Um, under certain circumstances, we have the observation that there is a force between some objects that acts along the direction between them, and that that force is not a gravitational force. That force can be generated just by rubbing two objects of the right types against one another and then separating them. The force as it is experimentally observed, falls off with distance as 1 over r squared, where r is the distance between the two objects. And then finally the odd part is that this force has some strange behavior, not like gravity. If we have two objects, and a, objects A and B attract one another, and objects A and C attract one another, then B and C actually repel one another. That tells us that something other than the simple gravitational law is going on in this case. That idea that we have uh, uh, sometimes a force that attracts and sometimes a force that repels tells us that there must be at least two types of objects, two classes of objects. We're going to call that property charge. And we're going to call those two properties of the material for the two objects as positive and negative charge. That choice of words is just a choice of words, but it allows us to do calculations. The observations are consistent with the model of two charge types if we have a rule that like charges, the same sign, repel one another, and opposite sign charges attract one another. Some additional rules are that the total charge is conserved, when the negative charge is created, a positive charge of the same amount must also be created. And that charge comes in individual tiny bits, that is, the charge is quantized. Those are facts that are observed separately from this course, and we're just going to use them as we proceed. What are some of the fundamental properties and units of charge? The SI unit of electric charge is the Coulomb. The Coulomb's actually a physically large amount of charge. Some typical charges are given in the table. The electron and proton carry the smallest indivisible amount of charge, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs. No charged object has ever been found with less than one electron charge. That is, if it has a charge, it has a charge of magnitude 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs. All atoms, or neutrons are neutral, but also all atoms are neutral as well with equal numbers of electrons and protons. We mentioned before that two objects rubbing against one another can result in separation of electrons and protons onto one object and the other. Each object then has a net charge. A person shuffling across a rug can end up with a charge as large as 10 to the minus 10 uh, coulombs, suggesting that a coulomb is indeed a physically very large number. Now we can get to the quantitative ideas behind Coulomb's law. First concept, because we have attractive and repulsive force, we conclude that there are at least two types of charge. We mentioned that. Uh, positive and negative are the labels that we use. Unlike charges attract one another, like charges repel one another. The magnitude of the force is found using the relationship shown here. Each charge exerts the equal and opposite force on the other charge. The force is proportional to the inverse square of the distance between the charges. The force is in the units of newtons, or kilogram meter per second squared. The distance is measured in meters, and the charge is measured in coulombs. We then need some scaling constant in order to scale between newtons on one side and coulombs per meter squared on the other side. That constant, called epsilon naught, is called the permittivity of free space and does the job of scaling between the two. The direction of the force on a certain object, for example q1 here, acts along the line between the two 
according to the rule that opposites attract. That can end up being a little bit complicated to remember or to calculate, so we have a more formal way of doing it. Here's the full calculation. If we want to be able to calculate the direction and magnitude of the force on a charged particle without worrying about the directions, we can implement Coulomb's law in its full vector form. We do have to be careful about defining the vector directions. In this case, if we want to calculate the force that charge 2 exerts on charge 1, then we have to take a little bit of care working through the subscripts of the various quantities here. So we're looking at the force that charge 2 exerts on 1. That's the way that we're going to write that, 2 on 1. All right. Uh, that force is proportional to the product of the two charges, and it's proportional to the square of the distance between the char two charges, just as we had on the previous slide. We have our scaling factor, but we want to include information with respect to the direction of the force. What we're going to do, if we're interested in the force of charge 2 on 1, we draw a vector from charge 2 to charge 1. The force will act along a line parallel to this direction. All right. If the two charges are positive, then that vector from 2 to 1 points away from charge 2, and as a result you have a repulsive force. If the two charges are of opposite sign, then the product Q1, Q2 is negative, and the vector direction here points toward Q2 with the result that we have an attractive force. I have uh, laid out a little bit more of the formalism with respect to the x and y coordinates of charge 1 and charge 2, and this information can actually just be dropped into a computer program in order to allow you to calculate the forces between two particles. In the laboratory, we work with materials that can usually be classified electrically into two types, conductors and insulators. The actual borderline between conductors and insulators can be somewhat fuzzy, but let's establish the basic rules. First, charge can move easily throughout a conductor. That's the key idea. Uh, and charge pretty much stays where it's put on an insulator. As I mentioned, the borderline can be a little bit fuzzy. Charge can move, but slowly in most materials we consider to be insulators. Usually, if the rearrangement of charge across the size of the object takes more than a few seconds, we consider it to be insulating. If it happens very rapidly, in microseconds, for example, we consider it to be a metal. Because charge can move freely in a metal or a conductor, the response of a neutral conductor, neutral conductor here, to an external charge could be unexpected. You might expect that because this metal here is neutral, this conductor is neutral, that there would be no force between an external charge and the neutral conductor. Instead, an uncharged metal object is always attracted to a nearby charge, no matter the sign of the charge. How can that be? In the absence of external charge and for a neutral object, electrons and protons are distributed equally and uniformly throughout the object. When an external charge is brought nearby, the electrons in the conductor respond. If the external charge is positive, electrons are pulled toward that positive charge, leaving behind the positive charge, equal and opposite positive charge in the material. This material is now considered to be polarized. The electrons in this material are closer to the external positive charge than the excess protons in the material, with the result that the electrons are more strongly attracted to this positive charge than the protons are repelled, with the result that the conductor is attracted towards the charge. If the charge were negative, I have an excess of positive charge here and an excess of negative charge on the other side, keeping the whole thing neutral, and the, electron, and the conductor would therefore be attracted to that charge as well.